have I lived to be a hundred? I don't know. I, I didn't aim for it. But you're still enjoying it. You know, when you reach my age, a certain serenity descends on you because you can have no ambitions for the future. So you have to do the right thing because you can damage yourself very much. Is that the biggest pleasure of getting old, that inner freedom that you've just described? No, because with getting very old, you acquire a lot. It's like becoming a second-hand car with a lot of breakdowns. But in the overall, it frees you from concerns about how your actions might affect your future. The U.S. State Department has calculated that Henry Kissinger flew 565,000 miles and visited 213 countries during his time as U.S. Secretary of State alone. He met Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, went boar hunting with Brezhnev. He met Golda Meir and Sadat, the Saudi king and the Iranian Shah, Indira Gandhi and the Pope. He was the inventor of shuttle diplomacy to end crises and wars through personal meetings, even with autocrats. You became famous as a politician for the idea of realpolitik. That's a very pragmatic approach of politics. In the biography of Niall Ferguson about you, he calls you an idealist. That's the title of the biography. Are you an idealist? I am a, an idealist who believes, however, that ideals have to be related to practical possibilities or that practical actions have to be inspired by ideals, but that you cannot get from where you are to your ideals in one step. And therefore, I believe today, if one wants to solve the problems of this world, that one has to be inspired by visions. And in politics, I believe that societies that, that permit this possibility are the right societies and are the ones that I attempt to encourage. Sometimes they have to go through stages of complicated decisions, but they must never lose their sense of freedom. Time and again, he has also been to Germany even with his parents, the homeland from which they had to flee as the Jews, the Nazis, and with which he nevertheless made his peace, even though relatives were murdered in the Holocaust. How did he manage to do so? We also talked to Henry Kissinger about this in a very personal interview at his country home in Connecticut, almost three hours from New York. Henry, we wanted to speak about Germany today. Let me ask you, the first question to your childhood, and if I may, I would like to ask the question in German and I would ask you to answer the question in German. Was ist das erste Bild aus deiner Kindheit? Was ist deine erste Erinnerung deines Lebens? Das erste Bild ist ein Gefühl der Festigkeit der Stabilität und eines normalen 
Lebens zwischen dem Haus in Fürth, wo ich aufgewachsen bin, und das Haus meiner Großeltern in Leutershausen, wo ich auf Ferien ging. What, what was the, the happiest moment of your childhood that you remember? I was uh, eight years old when Hitler came to power. And so before he came to power, I lived a satisfied and it didn't life its high points and of happiness were at family occasions or at what is Spielvereinigung of food. I would say those were the happiest moments of my life. And do you recall any pivotal moment when you first sensed the threats of the Nazi regime and well, aggression against Jews and against yourself? It didn't happen for me as a child that way. Uh, the, the middle class people who were my father's acquaintances and who my, or my family's acquaintances whom I saw at my house, uh, all had the view that Hitler would never come to power. And so I did not feel particularly threatened. My father did, but in our family, and I think in all of the middle-class families, you didn't involve children in political activities or in political concerns. That was left to the parents. After Hitler came to power, It changed dramatically. The people we had before seen in the streets were now in the government. And my father was dismissed from the gymnasium at which he taught. And from then on, uh, and then Hitler Youth kids could beat us up in the street as other children up, and that's when life became different. Do you recall any scenes at school where you've been bullied or where simply violence uh, was applied to you by Nazis? No, usually what happened, I was excluded from the gymnasium and They, they created a school, or they existed, a Jewish school. So my schoolmates were Jewish. Uh, since Jews were no longer permitted to be either in public schools or in gymnasiums. So I experienced being attacked on the streets by Hitler youth people. But one has to say that in the first phase of the Nazi period, the police was neutral. That is, they attempted to avoid that contribute, that attacks. But the whole atmosphere, as you may remember, was extremely hostile. 
with signs everywhere, Jews are not welcome here, Juden sind hier unerwünscht. So, a strong segregation started in which one had no German civilian friends. There was only one family that remained friendly to us in Leutershausen. As an American soldier, he came back to Germany and saw the horror. As a Jew who had had to flee from the Nazis, who had lost family members in the Holocaust, he saw a concentration camp for the first time when he took part in the liberation of the Hanover Alem concentration camp. A moment that shaped the rest of his life. I was shocked to, to the core of my being by the what I saw in the concentration camp. I had heard it about concentration camps and I knew they were not vacationary to it, but the degree of degradation of human beings that I saw there was beyond any ex experience. I couldn't believe that human beings could operate under such inhuman circumstances. And there was one prisoner, his name was Salma, and I talked to him, and it, it broke my heart. He was a young, a young man who had been thrown into this experience. And I wrote an article about him really for my internal use. And it, it was published later by in, in, in books. Why was yeah. that conversation so kind of life-changing almost for you? Could you describe that? What did you, what did you feel in that moment? And did it have any impact also on your future life as a politician. What made the conversation so special, it said that here was a person who had lived a normal life and was degraded to a point. Uh, these people looked like walking skeletons. They hadn't, they were malnutritioned in an extreme way. And I, I told this man that he could be free now. And this was almost incomprehensible to him, what that meant practically. And I followed his life later, he became Uh, he achieved a life in on the West Coast, and there was once a reunion of this concentration camp group at which I spoke. This was in the United States. But I, I came from a rich country with a military unit. And the contrast between its life and my life, I took freedom for granted. And for him, freedom was something almost inconceivable. Is it fair to say that you since then dedicated your life to freedom? 
I have dedicated my life to freedom in the sense of order and stability and to encourage societies to develop in that atmosphere. Despite the Holocaust and the fact that so many family members uh, of the Kissingers got killed by the Nazis, you came back to Germany without um, any feeling of revenge. Why did you want to reconcile with Germany and what enabled you to do so after all what has happened? Well, I have to say, in the early period, in the first months of occupation, I was not free of that feeling of revenge. But I didn't do anything about it. But after a month or two, when I saw the suffering that Germany was undergoing, I came to the conviction that a line had to be drawn and that actually as I got to know more about German history, uh, Hitler was a unique event in German history. I thought that the best service I could render was to bring about reconcil reconciliation with Germany and to help those in Germany who had a more positive view. I have huge regard for the leaders and people who built the common, the current Germany. Nevertheless, the current events in Germany with regard to the rise of right-wing populism are very worrying. The AfD, this very right-wing party in Germany, is in East Germany already in all polls the strongest and biggest party and is gaining incredible uh, support in large parts of the population for a very nationalist, isolationist direction. I think that would be, if Germany goes in that direction, it would be very unfortunate for Europe and for international order, but also for the idea of living as free societies. But do you have any explanation why that is possible in a post-war Germany in the 21st century? There are, of course, many grievances that develop when existing conditions are being changed. And many issues to adjust to. And there are also many issues about which one cannot do much at the, the moment. But when these are all consolidated into grievances, and when the grievances become the dominant view within a state, then its capacity to act and capacity to, to work coherently is undermined by the constant internal disputes that are going on. If you look at Germany today, how would you describe Germany? Is it a country of idealists, a country of ideologists? What is your take on the current state of mind of Germany? I think 
I think the government of Germany, it's led by people in a idealistic direction. But that the mood of Germany, the debate in Germany, is essentially rootless. That it, I, that it advocates ideals that cannot be realized and then condemns those who do not think they are practical. Uh, and so that the society is torn between its visions and its convictions. And that it doesn't know exactly which way to go now. In which direction should Germany develop? What should be the learnings of our history? It should not set itself absolute visionary goals. That it should have its visions, but it should realize that to solve immediate problems, adjustments are necessary. But it should also know that there are some dangers that are so absolute that they have to be resisted. Uh, but so I think the contemporary German Germany could lead a decisive could have a decisive role in the construction of the new order. And the new order is necessary because what was built after the war was impressive and important. But it made Germany from an, a state with no power of decision no significant power of decision into a country whose decision matter a great deal, often decisively, but without preparation for that. You are calling upon Germany for leadership. The world is expecting leadership, but Germany has difficulties with leadership. It is a discredited term in Germany. How can that be overcome? The reason for which Germany is discredited happened nearly a century ago. And you cannot make a nation pay a price for what its forefathers did. Uh, Germany as, of course, in the execution of its policies. Be sensitive to the well, its historic vulnerability. But I think it should look to the future. And we in countries around Germany have to permit Germany to look to its future. And therefore, it has to construct an international policy that permits it to play a leadership role. I think that at the end of the war in the Ukraine that Russia had started, Germany will play a major role, which it has not yet had a chance to assume in the construction of an international system. Uh, and it has to educate itself for the task the way it did at the beginning of the post-war period, and that is not yet apparent.
the invasion of a country, taking of hostages, killing them hostages, inflicting over a thousand casualties, that this could be believed to be possible in the international system is amazing. Now here we have an attack on Israeli territory itself, it, whose purpose can only be to mobilize the Arab world against Israel and to get off the track of peaceful negotiations. There has to be some penalty I think Israel has no choice except to invade Gaza and to try to put it to an end, put this kind of relationship to an end. They've been living side that one has to remember this territory was occupied by Israel. It was under the full control of, of Israel. And they withdrew voluntarily, without pressure. So the withdrawal was done in good faith. And in the expectation of proving how Israelis and Arabs could live together. But you can't have, you can't, make concessions to people who have declared and demonstrated by their actions that there cannot be peace. Henry, uh, various German chancellors have expressed unconditional support for uh, Israel's security and right of existence. What does that mean in the context of the current events? What should Germany do in that situation? I have negotiated several peace agreements in the Middle East. So I'm not in favor of unlimited conflict. But in this particular situation, in which a territory that Israel yielded voluntarily it has turned into a fortress aimed at Israel. Uh, I believe there should be unconditional political support for political support Israeli action. Political support only or also military support? I don't know what Israel needs at this moment. But so, in the extreme, yes. We had it uh, on German streets in Berlin that Arabs were publicly celebrating the attack and were distributing sweets to people on the streets. So well, is I, that the consequence of a failed uh, migration policy in Germany or I does mean, it... It was a grave mistake to let in so many people of totally different cultural and religious and conce uh, concepts because uh, it creates a pressure group inside each country that does that. Uh, so I find celebrations about what happened, which technically was a sort of criminal act as painful. You have met in your political life many uh, leaders, several times Mao, Brezhnev, Putin, other autocrats, dictators, populists. Which leader was the most scary personality that you have ever met? 
I don't like the word scary. Or dangerous. But in terms of capability of I would say Mao. He killed almost 90 million people. Mao is still would, celebrated in he China. He would kill what was needed to achieve his objectives. You have met Xi Jinping several times. Would you say that he has changed his personality and we have to deal with a different, more autocratic Xi today than no, a couple of years ago? I think the early Chinese leaders that we met, Deng Xiaoping, like Deng Xiaoping, uh, were easier to deal with because for them accommodation to the international system was of prime importance in order to build their economy. But, the fundam but as I have understood the Chinese better. It is, I believe, that we look at them as communists. I think for them communism is just a form that facilitates authoritarian rule and that they are really acting by Confucian principles. Now, Confucian principles require to operate at the utmost level of their capabilities. But it does not require acquisition of territory or domination of, of other countries, except in the sense that they think if they develop their capabilities, they will be entitled to the respect that the majesty of their behavior requires. That means that if we are weak, it is hard to conduct a meaningful policy. And if China should dominate the world, it will not be by conquest, it will be by performance. So if we do not want this to happen, as I don't, then I would say, then any failure in our relationship is in part due to a failure of our capacities. If we are strong and purposeful, I think coexistence with China is possible. And, and in the development of modern technology, it's necessary. How optimistic are you for the future of democracy? I think democracy is in trouble because it was started really by middle class societies in its present form, uh, which is relatively short in the span of human history. But it was f formed by societies which had no fundamental political differences between various groups and therefore in which the opposition was treated with respect. In the modern system, but the technology was relatively stable and slowly developing. Now the life of people changes dramatically 
and the inequalities of income are more obvious than they were in previous periods. So that uh, the need for compromise and for understanding, which you and I believe are central to a democratic system, are in great danger. And in the re that's in the West, and in the rest of the world, the easiest way to seize power is by control of the military and by control of, of government through authoritarian means. And once power is enjoyed, it's, people are very reluctant to leave it. So democracy is in danger. Democracy needs to rebuild itself. And I think that it's one of the key issues. It's an issue for America, and it's an issue for every other society, and the key ones of them are in Europe. Henry, from the perspective of a hundred-year-old person, um, are Biden and or Trump too old for office? Now, Biden is an elected president, and I have no I don't agree with some of his policies, but I don't attack him. Should there be, instead of a minimum age for an American president, perhaps a maximum age? Look, let me answer the question this way. The point of view that I represent and that I have explained to you has no candidate in the presidency now. But on issues of national interest, I will support, I have supported Biden in the Ukraine war. So He's a different phenomenon from Trump, with whom I also have had friendly relations. But Trump has been so focused on himself that I think he would find it very difficult to unify the country. Which political decision that you took in your career would you decide differently today? You know, I'm often asked that question. Strategically, this sounds arrogant. Strategically, I had studied the subject from my youth, I think the directions I wouldn't change, but there might be tactical, there are tactical decisions along the way that proved wrong, like my proclamation of the year of Europe was premature and therefore all. In the Vietnam War that is always mentioned, we, my 
overriding conviction was not to throw the government that had fought with us to the absolute And we, I thought we had to preserve this government that we had created. And that turned out to be incompatible with our domestic politics. But if we had acted otherwise, and by we, I don't mean me alone, or me primarily, but if America had acted otherwise and, th and thrown uh, South Vietnam to the wolves in any administration, it would have undermined the credibility of our alliances. So, uh, Should we have gotten out earlier? It's hard to say because our opponents would permit us to get out earlier only on conditions that would have looked like the absolute weakness of the United States an inability to protect them. Henry, you could make a political decision and it would be immediately executed without any discussion. Which decision would that be? What would you decide? On AI, I'm trying to bring together scientists and thoughtful people. The scientists have no evil intentions. Their intentions are good, but they're developing what they see. But we have to find a means of uniting that with the purposes of freedom and coexistence in the world. Artificial intelligence. How long is 100 years? When Henry Kissinger was born in Fürth in 1923, the first radio had just been licensed in Germany. Now he's working on artificial intelligence, has already written a book about it with ex-Google boss Eric Schmidt, and is currently working on the second. Radio, television, computers, the internet, smartphones and social media. He has experienced all the technical revolutions that have changed the world. And now, AI. Is AI the, the biggest uh, challenge of our times? I think it is. Will, in the long run, the machines serve human beings, or will human beings serve the machines? That's the question of our lifetime. And that's the question... You have to decide now. What do you think? I think it can be avoided, but only by understanding the essence of this intelligence which will also be able to generate its own point of view uh, it must be done it isn't being done because it is not understood yet and every new and new the evolution of these machines is in the hands of commercial entities, which therefore, of course, constantly develop brilliant advances. 
and the capacity is double in every year. It's the big challenge of our future. And it's on that level, uh, it's in the interest of China and other advanced countries and eventually all countries to join it because uh, otherwise they're in the hands of a machinery that they don't understand. I'm very concerned with AI. You asked a question and you get an answer and you believe in this answer even though you have no idea what the process is by which the answer is produced and how the computer acquires its own knowledge once it's machines can communicate with each other, which will certainly happen within five years. Then it becomes almost a species problem of whether the human species can retain its individuality in the face of this competition that it itself has created. Uh, this is the profound problem. We are now dealing with a genuinely different intelligence. Henry, very last question. In 50 years, how should people speak of you in one sentence. But I first want to say, I don't worry too much about that. Uh, but I'd like to them to think of me as having been born in a free society and wanted to bring, to contribute to world order so that freedom isn't constrained by constant crisis. That's why I've devoted myself in various wars around the world to bringing them to a constructive end and wherever possible a democratic solution. Thank you very much, Henry. It was a pleasure talking to you. But in 50 years, an LLM may <laughs> Make a gift that answer. Thanks very much, Henry. <laughs>